Hello, my friends, and welcome to Origins. My name's Don Chapman. It's my privilege to be your host. I have a great guest with me here today, and we're going to talk about a subject that uh, is not lacking in controversy and I think is one that will uh, excite and generate some interest from you as well. My guest, Brad Harib, who is a Ph.D. from the University of Tennessee School of Medicine, is going to talk to us about the National Geographic in November of 2004. Brad, why is that issue so important? The, uh, the cover story of that particular issue was, was Darwin wrong? And, of course, you can imagine National Geographic, uh, not one to shy away from the topic of evolution, says, no, the evidence for evolution, they say, is overwhelming. That's a pretty big no on the screen. Uh, yeah, that you like the small font they uh, yeah, use there. They They're making a point there, aren't they? <laughs> they are. Now, what you're going to do for us on the show today is you're going to take this overwhelming evidence that they say they have, and you're going to take it point by point and refute their evidence. Piece by piece. In fact, they start out by saying that, that evolution is a theory that you can take to the bank. To the they, bank. They go on to say that the supporting evidence is abundant, various, ever-increasing, solidly interconnected, easily available in museums, popular books, textbooks, and a mountainous accumulation of peer-reviewed scientific studies. No one needs to and no one should accept evolution merely as a matter of faith. The first thing we, we probably ought to talk about is the author okay. of this particular study. A fellow by the name of David Quayman is the author. He apparently is the person who, who has the authority to tell us Darwin was not wrong. And he is that because he is a world-famous scientist? No. Actually, if you'll notice on the, the screen, he did an interview for the Seattle Post Intelligencer Reporter where he, he admitted, he said, I did my graduate work on William Faulkner. My training was all in literature, not biology, but when I couldn't make it as a fiction writer, and I would say... Brad, you're setting me up here. It's just, you, you got to tell me. He made it as a fiction he writer. Did. He, he did. had to change John Ray a little. He couldn't write novels. But what, what we're going to get in these next few pages is some pretty interesting fiction. Yeah, so, he, he, you know, basically he ends up by saying, I get to talk to biologists, walk through rainforests and see the world. And, and apparently that qualifies him yeah. to tell us that Darwin was right. God bless the rainforest. <laughs> now, now, listen, you have a Ph.D. from the Medical School University of Tennessee. Yes, sir. And yet you constantly have evolutionists tell you that you're not educated because you believe in creation. Yeah, that's, it's the whole intimidation of all intelligent people believe evolution. Right, all educated people believe. And yet we have a, a fiction writer who's used to write the story to prove that evolution's true. That's classic. Yes, it is. All right, now, we need to get on with this. You, you've got this evidence, so one point at a time. The first thing is horse evolution. Horse evolution, two terms we need to talk about very quickly. They basically represent the same creature. Uh, Eohippus and Hyracothrium, and simply put, it's the creature that we see right here at the bottom of the screen. Okay. Uh, supposedly, this is the creature that all modern-day horses evolved from. 60 million years ago. The only problem with that is that beautiful little timeline is not real. Harold Nielsen commenting on this, he said, the family tree of the horse is beautiful and continuous only in the textbooks. In the reality provided by the results of research, it is put together from three parts, of which only the last can be described as including horses. The forms of the first part are just as much little horses as present-day daemons are horses. The construction of the horse is therefore a very artificial one, since it is put together from non-equivalent parts and cannot therefore be a continuous transformation series. Don, the point I want to make there is the year that that was written. 1954. 1954. We already knew that this idea of horse evolution was imaginary all the way back in 1954, and yet November of 2004, National Geographic is marching this out as evidence. Fifty Darwin years right. later, they're still saying this is some of the best evidence we have in the world to prove the theory of evolution. That's right. Incredible. That's right. When they already knew it was wrong for 50 years. George Gaylord Simpson said the uniform, continuous transformation of Hyracothrium into Equius, so dear to the hearts of generations of textbook writers, never, never. happened in nature. That's amazing. And ironically, because of that, some textbooks have actually dropped the horses and now they're going to camels. Now, that's why is there any more evidence to use the same logic for camels than there was for horses? Simply put, we've disproven the horses so often that, that they realize, hey, we've got caught, so to speak. So we're going to substitute. We're going to use a, a similar picture, because after all, that's what's teaching the kids, is this idea in that's their right. mind, this picture. That's right. 
What I want you to notice, though, Don, is who the publisher of that particular textbook is. Uh, and that would be National Geographic. National Geographic. <laughs> so here we have the publisher of a textbook who has dropped the idea of horse evolution because they know they've, they've been caught in the past, and yet one of the first evidences they march out for us in November of 04 is horse evolution. There's no integrity here. Absolutely not. It doesn't stop there. Number two, embryology. Uh, evolutionists would like us to believe that as a, a creature develops in the womb, whether it be a human or an animal, it goes through evolutionary steps. In fact, in their magazine they say, Darwin wrote, the embryo is the animal in its less modified state, and that state reveals the structure of its progenitor. There's an there's assumption here beyond evolution. There's an assumption that the whole evolutionary uh, process happens in the womb. There's no evidence for that, is there? Absolutely not. And yet, on, on the screen, you'll notice a, a picture that is probably very familiar to a lot of the viewers out there. This one was, was drawn by a fellow by the name of Hernst Haeckel, and basically put these embryos, he would say, suggest evidence for evolution. I remember that from my eighth grade science textbook, oh, by it's, the way. It's still very, very popular in textbooks. The way we read it, if you look down here at the bottom, this would be a, a fish, a salamander, a turtle, a chicken, a pig, a couple of mammals. And finally, over here at the end, we have a human at three different embryological states. Huh. His point being that early on, up here at this top row, he would say that all creatures, whether it be a fish, a salamander, or a human, that were basically all the same. I mean, if you look across there, there's not a whole lot of difference. He, in fact, said that his turning point in his thinking was when he read Charles Darwin's book on the origin of species. And yet we know today Ernst Haeckel lied. He actually forged those images I just showed you. On, on this particular screen, you'll notice Haeckel's embryos are at the top, and the real picture is there at the bottom. In fact, Haeckel uh, was... Uh was disciplined as, as a uh, professor for lying, right? Yes, he was. In fact, uh, he, the, the story goes that he was kicked out of the University of Jena. You know, we've known literally for centuries now, he lied in his pictures, and yet they keep showing so, up. So who's the bigger liar? The man who drew the pictures in the first place knowing they weren't true, or the people who have continued to perpetuate the lie to our children when they knew it wasn't true? That's right. And even evolutionists admit it. In Natural History uh, magazine in the year 2000, Stephen Jay Gould, very well-known evolutionist, he commented on Ernst Haeckel's embryos. Now, I want you to look at what he said. He said, we should therefore not be surprised that Haeckel's drawings entered the 19th century textbooks, but we do, I think, have the right to be both astonished and ashamed by the century of mindless recycling <laughs> that has led to the persistence of these drawings in a large number, if not majority, of textbooks. A, a phrase, century of mindless recycling of lies. Yes. You know, we did a show, uh, another show on indoctrination, and it just says to me, you know, if you're looking for truth, you don't reproduce lies. Right. But if you're trying to perpetuate a theory for which you have no evidence, then you don't care if it's true. You just care if kids believe it. That's right. And that's what they're doing now. That's right. Sir Arthur Keith, in commenting on, on embryology, uh, he said it was expected that the embryo would recapitulate the features of its ancestors from the lowest to the highest forms in the animal kingdom. Now that the appearance of the embryo at all stages is known, the general feeling is one of disappointment. The human embryo at no stage is anthropod in appearance. The embryo of the mammal never resembles the worm, the fish, or the reptile. Embryology provides no support whatsoever for the evolutionary hypothesis. If you look at the date when Sir Arthur Keith made this comment, it was 1932. Yes. We knew embryology provides no support whatsoever for evolutionary hypothesis. And yet, we're marching it out. years later, we're marching it's still it out. the best thing we got, and we know it's a lie. Isn't that incredible? And you ask yourselves, are we, are we still putting in textbooks? Definitely. Yeah, that's absolutely damning evidence. Third piece, I'm going to go up to the board and show you. We're going to talk about a creature called Archaeopteryx. He is the, the creature that is supposed to link dinosaurs to birds. And in fact, if you want to know more about him, all you need to do, Don, is run down to Wendy's and grab your child a, a Happy Meal, so to speak. Here we see a, a kid's Happy Meal. Notice at the bottom what it says. Fact, big red, big red letters, new findings show that birds are probably related to dinosaurs. 
Scientists in China have discovered two fossils of feathered dinosaurs. You know, I have a hard time with that word fact and probably in the same yes, sense. Yes, a little evil of marketing again <laughs> yeah. here. You know, fact, new, new findings show that birds are probably related to dinosaurs, but that's a fact, Don. Yeah, and our, and our children, we wouldn't expect them to pick that up. Not at all. Again, we're indoctrinating. Here's the, uh, one of the, the Archaeopteryx fossils. The big deal is the, this creature had teeth. And we know today modern birds don't have teeth. We do know that there used to, to be on this planet a, a whole species of birds that did. The thing is, evolutionists need a, a link. They need to figure out, hey, how can we explain birds using our theory? But I want you to think, Don, if, if they were able to explain flight, let's say this creature was that missing link, they still have to explain how did we evolve flight in insects, Flying reptiles, i.e. The, the pterodactyls, pterodons, we've got mammals like bats that can also fly. Right. If you want to throw in flying fish, we could do that as well. You have to explain that evolutionary procedure in a lot of different creatures. So even if it were true, it really wouldn't make the point. Exactly. This particular creature, uh, according to Colin Patterson, who served as the, the senior paleontologist at the British Museum of Natural History, he says it's simply become a patsy for wishful thinking. He went on to question, he said, is Archaeopteryx the ancestor of all birds? Perhaps yes, perhaps no. There is no way of answering the question. It's easy enough to make up stories of how one form gave rise to another, to find reasons why the stages should be favored by natural selection, but such stories are not a part of science, for there is no way of putting them to the test. You know, you have to give him credit. He understands what science is, and he says these are stories, they're not science. Exactly. And yet again, this is being presented as one of the three or four most irrefutable evidences for the fact of evolution. Col uh, Alan Fiducia, probably one of the world's foremost bird specialists, favors with what Colin Patterson said. Alan Fiducia concluded that Archaeopteryx was a boral volant, considerably advanced aerodynamically, probably capable of flapping powered flight to at least some degree. Listen to his conclusion. Archaeopteryx was, in the modern sense, a bird. Just a bird with teeth. A bird. And, you know, sadly, we've known that since 1993. 2004, we're marching this out as evidence that Darwin was right. And obviously, if we had other better evidence, we wouldn't be marching this out. Ironically, National Geographic tried a, a similar thing five years earlier, 1999. In fact, I would encourage viewers to, to go to the library, check out the November 1999 issue of National Geographic, where there's a, an article titled Feathers for T-Rex. Now you'll notice, Don, look at what they're saying right here. New bird-like fossils are missing links in dinosaur evolution. Any question there? No, it's a fact. That's what they're telling us. In this particular article, they go on to announce a new creature called Archaeoraptor. The only problem is Archaeoraptor was a complete fraud. Archaeoraptor actually evolved in a Chinese farmhouse where some Chinese <laughs> farmers took the, the front half of a dinosaur, the back half of a bird, they pasted them together and sold it to some very unsuspecting American scientists. Well, you've got to admire their ingenuity, but you can't admire their truth. That's right, that's right. Doesn't end there. The fourth piece of evidence National Geographic offers us is natural selection. Survival of the fittest, so to speak. And I, I want to make sure that the viewers out there understand we know natural selection does occur. We know that there are small micro-evolutionary changes that, that can occur to help weed out the unfit. In fact, it was a creationist, a fellow by the name of Edward Blythe, who actually came up with that theory. But we need to understand natural selection does not provide a mechanism for macroevolution. That is, this idea that we all came from one particular creature. You know, right now I have two golden retrievers at my house who are supposed to be able to retrieve balls. One of them actually likes to watch me retrieve. <laughs> but Think with me for just a moment, Don. If, if we breed two dogs, what do we still get? A dog. We get a dog. And, and we may get a short hair, long hair, but we still get a dog. Long legs, short legs, but, but dogs make dogs. Right. The thing that we need to understand, yes, we can make small changes. Microevolution does occur. Absolutely. We know that within limited parameters. The problem is they teach this truth to our, our children and grandchildren and then try to slip in macroevolution. Oh, this idea that... 
everything originated from a common ancestor. And, and just so our viewers are tracking with you, microevolution is adaptability and change within the species. Yes. We have lots of evidence of that. Yes. Nowhere in the world and nowhere in any one study have we ever seen one species evolve to another species, which is what we would call macroevolution. Exactly. We don't see dogs, for instance, giving rise to a rhinoceros or a fern or a giraffe. No. Dogs give rise to dog. Corn, if you were to take a seed of corn, put it in the closet, wait a hundred years, plant that seed of corn, you're going to get corn. And no matter how hard a cat wishes, it can never become a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Swedish biologist Soren Luthrop said micromutations do occur, but the theory that these alone can account for evolutionary change is either falsified or else it is an unfalsifiable, hence metaphysical theory. He went on to say, I suppose that nobody will deny that it's a great misfortune if an entire branch of science becomes addicted to a false theory. But this is what has happened in biology. I believe that one day the Darwinian myth will be ranked the greatest deceit in the history of science. When this happens, many people will pose the question, how did this ever happen? I believe that man's a prophet. I agree. Hugo de Vries, in talking about this idea of natural selection, he summed it up best. He said, natural selection may explain the survival of the fittest, but it cannot explain the arrival of the fittest. That's profound. Don, he made that comment all the way back in 1905. And yet, November 2004. hundred years later, we're still trying to run the same old tired theory up the flagpole. Yep. The fifth piece of evidence they offer is vestigial structures. Now, some of the viewers may not be familiar with that particular word. Vestigial structures, according to evolutionists, would be things that, that we don't need, that are, are evolutionary baggage, like for instance, the appendix or the tonsils or, or your little toe, even though I think most viewers out there, if they were to cut off their little toe, they would probably not consider it vestigial. Textbooks used to say we had over 180 vestigial organs in the human body. That list has pretty much all but disappeared thanks to our growing knowledge today. I want you to notice this progression. 1989, they were still touting vestigial structures as evidence for evolution. So 89, you know, they're saying, look, you've got all these parts in you you don't need. 1994, they're showing pictures of a, a human appendix, a horse appendix. They're saying, hey, look, these are evolutionary ancestors. They, they go together. Well, lo and behold, 1998, we realized that appendix, it has a function. Is that about the last organ in the human body that was considered to be that? Probably. Uh, there, there's a, a part in the nose, one of the, uh, the vomers in the nose that was also considered to be vestigial. Notice what they say about the appendix. Long regarded as a vestigial organ with no function in the human body, the appendix is now thought to be one of the sites where immune responses are initiated. In fact, we know its removal also increases a person's susceptibility to leukemia, Hodgkin's disease, cancer of the colon, and cancer of the ovaries. Wow, that makes it pretty uh, special and pretty important, doesn't it? How many evolutionists would allow us to go ahead and cut out all of their alleged vestigial organs in a sterile environment if they don't really need them? It sounds like what vestigial really meant was we haven't figured out what its purpose is yet. That's precisely what R.L. Weissong said. He said, not too long ago, man was imputed to have 180 vestiges. Organs like the appendix, the tonsils, the thymus, pineal gland, the thyroid gland, they were all on the list. Today, all former vestigial organs are known to have some function during the life of the individual. If the organ has any function at any time, it cannot be called rudimentary or vestigial. As man's knowledge has increased, the list of vestigial organs decreased. So what was really vestigial? Was it not man's rudimentary knowledge of the intricacies of the body? Well, I think we're going to have to scratch that one off the list of proofs for evolution. We got to take a break, Brad, and we'll be back in a minute to talk about viruses and bacteria. It's the last uh, one of the arguments left, and then to wrap this up. We have to go to break right now, folks. Don't go away, because I think you need to hear about this last evidence that's offered in National Geographic, and then you need to hear the truth. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Creation versus evolution. You weigh the evidence. The bird feather. It couldn't just happen. For their weight, Feathers are stronger than any man-made structures. The design and functions of a feather are even more astounding. Evolutionists claim that reptile scales evolved into feathers. 
feathers have a much more complex DNA structure than reptile scales, there is virtually no similarity between the two, nor is there any fossil evidence showing the transition from scale to feather. So how can evolutionists claim this really happened? Today's guest on Origins, Dr. Brad Harrop, is the co-founder of Focus Press Incorporated. He's also the co-editor of Think Magazine, where he's contributed many articles concerning the subject of creation. If you're searching for the truth and God's answers to life's questions, you'll want to subscribe to Think Magazine. Orders are being taken at 866-313-6474. For more information about Dr. Harrop, you can write to Focus Press Incorporated, 1600 Westgate Circle, Suite 125, Brentwood, Tennessee, 37027. Or visit the website at www.focuspress.org. All right, we're back from the break, and it's good to have you with us. We're here with Dr. Brad Harob, and he's talking to us about the November of 2004 issue of National Geographic, which asked the question, was Darwin wrong? And it has in great big letters, no, and it gives six evidences to back up today the theory of evolution. We've refuted five of those, doctor, magnificently. There's one left. Uh, the first five seem to have crumbled to dust. Uh, the last one has to do with uh, bacteria and viruses. Will you talk to us about that? I, I suspect most of the viewers out there have heard the phrase resistant strains of bacteria. Uh, you know, oftentimes we, we hear that, especially in a hospital setting. National Geographic says there is no better or more immediate evidence supporting the Darwinian theory than this process of forced transformation among our immunicable germs. This is the best they've got, according to their own wording. This is it. And yet, when you think about it for just a moment, the first thing the viewers need to understand is that antibiotic resistance did not occur as a result of the person getting an antibiotic. For instance, if, if someone were to go into the hospital, a car wreck, they get some antibiotics. Three days later, the doctor comes and says, I'm sorry, you've developed a, a resistant strain of bacteria. That resistant strain was not a result of the person getting an antibiotic. That resistant strain was already present. So there, nothing happened to change inside their body. They caught something that was in the hospital. Exactly. The resistant strain is like... medicine for it. Yes, okay. In fact, what happened was they were given an antibiotic that killed the nor normal bacteria, allowing that resistant strain to then flourish. I see. The second point we need to make is... Resistant strains are usually not as virulent. They usually don't reproduce as quickly, and it, it's hardly a, an argument for survival of the fittest if you have actually a weaker strain. And last but not least, and, and definitely most importantly, regardless of how the bacteria acquire their antibiotic resistance, they are still exactly the same bacteria after receiving that trait as they were before receiving it. This is the best they've got right here. And I, I just think that's amazing. You know, this is a tremendously important program that you've taken their stuff that they're using to say we're so confident to believe in evolution. Look at this evidence. But when we do look at the evidence, it's old wives' tales and myths that have been disproved sometimes for 100 years. They asked the question themselves, was Darwin wrong? I think the evidence says yes, the evidence is, for evolution is weak and pathetic. It's only when we actually ask the question, what is really backing it up that we're going to learn the truth? Which makes us appreciate all the more the work that you and others like you are doing to make the truth known. Uh, you know, I never meet a creationist who isn't thrilled to look at the evidence of the evolutionists. Constantly I'm looking at evolutionists who are scared to death of the evidence being presented by creationists. Because the truth will stand up to scrutiny. Dr. Harab, we're so thankful for you being here today and for Thank your you work. Are. You know, above all else, I don't want you to ever forget this, that it's God's view that he created you, and that should be your worldview too. Thank you so much for being with us, and we look forward to seeing you next time. God bless you.
Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file of program number 806 from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program, number 806, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.